Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, our agenda sees three different presentations. We will start with an overview of the newly established organization called Avicenna Alliance, which sees the participation of both industry members and academic members from the VPH Institute. Adriano Henne is wearing a double hat today, being both the executive director of the VPH Institute and the secretary general of the Alliance, will give us all the relevant information on this new initiative and will talk us through the activity plan uh, of the Alliance for 2016. We will then proceed with a presentation by Liz Garris, who is the chair of the Policy Affairs Working Group of the VPH Institute. She will present um, the important activities that have been done uh, by this group of the past years, and she will also explain the reason why it's important to contribute to these sort of uh, activities. Last but not least, uh, we will have uh, our policy consultant from Broad Public Policy, James Kennedy, that will introduce the new working groups that are getting established by the Avicenna Alliance in collaboration with the VPH Institute and will explain the activities that this working group will be focusing on uh, and how you can contribute to this work. At the end of this presentation, we will have a very brief uh, Q&A session. So in case you have any question to ask, uh, that's the right time. As you have noticed, all the attendees are muted by default. But uh, in any case, over the webinar, you have the possibility to uh, raise your hand. You can see there is a hand button um, on, the, uh, on, the, on your panel. Or also, you have the possibility to write uh, your question on the dedicated box um, on the panel on, you, on the right hand side of your screen. Um, I think we are ready to start. I'm now going to uh, give the word to Adriano for his presentation. Thank you, Martina. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for this webinar, which I think is announcing a pretty exciting development for the Virtual Physiological Human Institute, and it's, uh, it's in its evolution to grow increasingly its partnership uh, with industry. Um, and the focus, as Martina has said, is going to be talking about the alliance, which we now have produced. Um, and we've got the three sp speakers, which Martina has al already mentioned. So we call it the Avicenna Alliance, and I'll explain a little bit about why it's called the Avicenna Alliance, and it's an association for predictive medicine. So I think, actually, we need to start by giving what we believe, what, what our definition of predictive medicine is. I mean, you can talk to an awful lot of people, and they'll have their own interpretations of what predictive medicine could be or it might be, their own view of it. For the purposes of our business within the Virtual Physiological Human Institute and the Alliance, predictive medicine or in silico medicine, we're trying to raise that as a brand name as well, is the use of computer modeling and simulation in the diagnosis, treatment or prevention of disease. An important point about this is that this is a foundation that will contribute to advance and enable the concepts of personalized and predictive and precision medicine. Uh, it will be the processing tool that takes raw data, masses of raw data and information and processes it in a way that is interpretable and can create actionable information rather than uh, you know, sort of manipulated data sets. And that will inform decisions about healthcare. That's going to be really important because it will help us to understand the complexities of the interactions that underpin the dynamics of physiology and the physiology of disease and the physiology of the responses of, therapy, of disease to therapeutics, what it might be. Interestingly also, if we look at the industry needs, the use of computer modeling and simulation can have a significant impact on rationalizing and improving and streamlining uh, processes to reduce costs. So what actually is the Avicenna Alliance? Well, it's a market-focused partnership uh, of industries coming together, all healthcare industries, whether they're pharma, whether they're device industries, whether they are software providers, 
uh, biotechs or cosmetic industries, any industry that can see the use of the platforms of modeling and simulation in silico technologies as benefiting and producing uh, improvements in their business. It's a partnership with the VPH Institute, as we said from the start. The VPH Institute is core to this as the academic representative. Uh, it has an origin in two funded projects, well, actually it's more than two funded projects. The Institute itself is the history of many, many funded projects over many years that have culminated in the um, establishment of the not-for-profit Institute. But more recently, one specific European Commission uh, funded project, the Avicenna Roadmap for In Silico Medicine, which concluded last September and produced its roadmap and published its roadmap last September. There were two specific requirements from that um, uh, last project. One was uh, obviously the delivery of the document itself with its recommendations, but also was the creation of an alliance with industry, and that is the foundation for the Avicenna Alliance. The purpose of the Alliance is looking at addressing the regulatory barriers and developing the policies on in silico medicine that are going to enable the market. Now it's important to realize that we're not talking about just generating policies to constrain and prevent people from doing things. On the contrary, these are areas which are not completely regulated as, the, as we go forward. And in order for these technologies to be allowed to flourish and develop and uh, in, in the right kind of uh, environment, there is a regulatory framework that needs to be developed to give it uh, clear credence and importance in the context of medicine. So we're working in partnership to be able to develop a framework that will encourage the evolution and blossoming of these technologies. And we're needing to link the healthcare industries increasingly with researchers to enable that, to be able to inform and educate and have the right kind of technology input and understanding to, uh, to the development of these policies. The structure of the Alliance, it's really important to recognize that this is a true 50-50 partnership between the healthcare industry representatives and the representation of the academic community from the VPH Institute and they come together at board level and they come together in three key working groups which we'll hear more about later from James. These are three key areas. One is clearly the area of policy development which we'll expand on later uh, and the second one is in the area of trying to harmonize how we do this across areas, regulatory territories, whether it's the US, whether it's the U EU or whether it's Asia Pacific. That's actually quite important because an in industry the last thing you need is to develop a policy in one particular territory and have to then rehash it and do something completely different because the policy in the States or in the Asia Pacific is completely different and that costs money and time. If we're doing this from scratch and we try and harmonize this area across those territories, that would be incredibly beneficial to industry and it will help to focus the contribution of, of academics to that process. And the third critically important area is the engagement of the research uh, activity in responding to the challenges and the priorities that we identified in the roadmap, responding to calls uh, that, will, uh, that will appear in the Horizon 2020 program or indeed elsewhere uh, by bringing industry and academic centers together to respond specifically to research projects. For 2016, this is going to be my last slide before I hand over, for 2016 Clearly, this is a formation year for the Alliance. We started in January. We've already had a significant impact on a number uh, of areas. We've had a significant in, in degree of interest from industries coming together uh, in trying to, to, to join the Alliance. We're needing to provide uh, advice to the European Commission on the drafting of a specific consultation on in silico medicine. That is a, that is a, a specific process uh, which is very important that can lead into uh, new development of new policy and James will mention that later in his talk. We're needing to work towards the inclusion of regulatory acceptance of modeling and simulation in the medical devices and the reopened European medicines regulations. That's something that's happened literally last week and Lise will mention that at the end of her talk. That was really exciting development. That is the culmination of a lot of work that's been done over a number of years by the VPH Institute members and our partners and, and friends. And we need then to create uh, partnerships, as I said, between the EU um, 
between the researchers and industry, uh, the, the researchers being within the virtual physiological human framework and responding to those calls, again, some of which Lise will mention in her talk, which have been specifically identified in Horizon 2020, that have been uh, the results of influencing and lobbying uh, from uh, the membership of the VPH uh, Policy Affairs Working Group. And finally, uh, in 2016, even though the Alliance will have kicked off in January this year, we will formally launch it in the European Parliament in Brussels in October. It will be the first global policy conference on in silico medicine, which will involve uh, members of the European Parliament, the commissioners, and our industry partners. And uh, More will appear on the websites and the news channels associated uh, with the Alliance in the coming weeks and months. So essentially that's all I've got to say uh, to introduce where we've come from, where we are with the Alliance. I'm now going to hand over to Lise who, as um, Martina mentioned, uh, Professor Lise Garrett uh, from Eleven, who has chaired the Policy Affairs Working Group in the VPHI for some time and she's going to outline uh, her experiences and how we've got to this point uh, from the work of the PAWG and other areas. Over to you, Lise. Thank you, Adriano. Good afternoon, everybody, from my side as well. Um, next slide, please. What I will try to explain um, today is, from my point of view, how I got to be involved in the Policy Affairs Working Group and what have been the, the major results over the last couple of years. So, to start off with, um, my personal experience with the working group started in 2012, 13, something like that. Um, I had established my own research group a couple of years before that, and I saw all the developments um, in the VPH community, and I wanted to get involved. That was all that there was to it, so I contacted the director of the VPH Institute at the time, Marco Vici Conti, and I asked him, how can I get involved? Um, in the VPH, and he suggested the Policy Affairs Working Group. At that time, I didn't have, I only had very little experience with policy making, and I had no experience at all with lobbying, let alone on the European level. But actually, the way of working uh, that we have adopted in the Policy Affairs Working Group actually uh, accommodates for this. So, what? How we do things is, well, we start with questions from the community or from the, the VPH board or uh, anything that is related to in silico uh, medicine. And then uh, we get a good deal of input from uh, the consultants at Road Public Policy who help us to identify the right people, the right initiatives, the right calls to uh, the right uh, con consultations to respond to uh, and help us draft those responses. And this is really a collaboration where they provide their expertise on lobbying and policy making and we, well, represent the research community and we know where we want to take uh, this research. So this is a, a very good partnership that we have going in the Policy Affairs Working Group. And it has led over the last years to a number of results that we're actually uh, quite proud of. Next slide, please. Um, the results, I have grouped them in mainly four categories, that is response to consultations, the writing of position papers, uh, creating alliances with stakeholders, and the interaction with the European Parliament and Commission. Now, when I say we, I always talk about the Policy Affairs Working Group as a whole. Of course, in all these things, there is always a few people that take the initiative, but I'll just say we to make it um, easier. Next slide, please. When it comes to the consultations, well, these are consultations mainly from uh, the European Commission that want to get information from uh, the communities on certain subjects. For instance, mHealth, they had a green paper that they published on mHealth and they had a number of questions uh, related to that. So from the, from the Policy Affairs Working Group, from the VPH Institute, we try to give our perspective on how mHealth should be more than just mobile or telehealth that is uh, defined in a very narrow way, being just using your mobile phone to access your electronic health record. So we try to introduce uh, the concept of modeling simulation, uh, modeling and simulation there. Um, the consultation uh, concerning FET Open, FET stands for uh, Future and Emerging Technologies. So this is a series of um, 
uh, large-scale projects um, that have calls a few times per year uh, where they were looking for subjects and they did an, uh, an open call for subjects, so we responded there. Um, and then you have the work program 2016-2017 um, where there was also a consultation that we responded to. Next slide, please. We wrote a number of position papers. Uh, quite a few years ago, we wrote a position paper on animal experimentation, um, testifying to how in silico uh, medicine or modeling and simulation could help to realize the three R's. And last year, uh, we also wrote an, uh, an additional uh, position paper in response to the uh, Stop PV section campaign, where we again highlighted um, the added value of modeling and simulation, but we argued against the abolishment of all animal experimentation. We wrote uh, a position paper on big data and how modeling and simulation is complementary, can, can be complementary to big data. Um, and then we also collaborated with ESMO on a, a position paper on data, the data protection regulation. Next slide, please. I already mentioned uh, ESMO. Next slide, please. So that means that we try to uh, create alliances with stakeholders so that we uh, can form a bigger group and we can have more, we can weigh in more uh, with, the part, with the Commission and the Parliament. And you see here listed a number of those partners, which are the European Society for Medical Oncology, who had a data protection regulation position paper uh, that we endorsed. There is the Center for, for Alternatives to Animal Testing, um, on which we collaborated on the already mentioned EMA regulation amendments, to which, uh, which I will explain in more detail uh, a bit further on. And then there is the, the YAMBES, the European Alliance for Medical and Biological Engineering, um, for which we, on, on which we collaborated for the position paper on the Stop PV Section campaign. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, finally, a big... Uh, Part of our activities relates to the interaction with the European Parliament and the European Commission. And in 2013, we focus on the former, and the last few years, we've been um, focusing on the latter. Next slide, please. When it comes to the interaction with the EU Parliament, in 2013, we did a series of um, meetings with members of Parliament where we uh, explained about VPH technology and tried to get explicit support uh, for the VPH technology, which resulted uh, partially in this uh, um, event that was hosted by two MEPs from different political groups in the parliament, um, where we were able to showcase um, VPH or brand VPH as an EU funding e-health success story. Next slide, please. Um, similar or in relation to this, um, we were, or VPH technology was explicitly endorsed as an e-health success uh, story. And so they um, called on the Commission and the member states to actually keep on supporting uh, VPH-like technology uh, and modeling and simulation for personalized medicine. Next slide, please. More explicitly, uh, there was also a parliamentary question from a number of MEPs from three different political groups, if I'm not mistaken, where they, ex where they asked the Commission how the support for VPH was going, going to be taken care of in the next Horizon 2020 work program, and they refer here to the 14-15 um, and also the 16-17 work program. And in the response, next slide please, the DG Connect uh, mentioned a few calls in the 1415 work program that were related to in silico medicine in general, but they also indicated that in the next, so in the 1617 work program, um, they intended to further support the development of in silico models and methods. And to make sure that they would actually do that, we started focusing our activities on uh, the interactions with the Euro Euro European Commission uh, after that. So next slide, please. So we had, uh, again, a series of meetings, this time with members of the European Commission, both of the DG Connect and the DG Research. And you see here a number of names. For people who are familiar with the DGs, they see, you can see that these are 
not the, the assistants that were there, but the, the big shots of these DGs. Uh, and we were uh, able to present VPH um, and its successes obtained so far. Next slide, please. What was clear from these meetings is that there was still a lot of support for VPH, but um, that they wanted to have more information, see more output from the VPH in order to help us uh, get support and weigh in on behalf of the VPH. So a number of questions, we received a number of questions um, that we have tried to work on since then. These include more information on specific subjects, more success stories, examples of how uh, specific regulations could threaten research, how they could weigh in, and also um, they wanted to have information on our strategy to pursue validation and industrial outreach. Next slide, please. The interaction with DG, DG Research went along the same lines, so they wanted to uh, help us get support, so they wanted to see exactly, they wanted to have some call texts or drafts of call texts, and they wanted us to, res to respond to the consultation regarding uh, the work program. Next slide, please. So for the remainder uh, of the slides of my part, I will show a number of results that actually came directly or indirectly from these meetings with the European Commission. So at their request, we drafted a couple of call texts related to in silico clinical trials and the basic developments of in silico medicine. And you see here from the work program 2016-2017, so the one that uh, for which the calls are being launched right now, um, a number of uh, calls that directly or indirectly incorporate the idea of um, in silico medicine. And two of those very show remarkable correspondence to the call text, the draft call text that we provided uh, to the commission. Next slide, please. Another series of results uh, included an internal consultation that we did amongst the membership of the VPH to assess um, the level of clinical translation of our technologies and the, the technology readiness levels of the different models and model systems that are being uh, pursued. We also, or the VPH Institute, uh, more explicitly communicated its success stories um, there was the big data position paper and the data protection position paper that were published uh, soon after that. And then as far as the outreach to the industry goes, well, this was um, already being identified within the Avicenna Consortium and has then led to the creation of the Avicenna Alliance. Um, last sli next slide, please. And this, together with uh, the Avicenna Alliance, so the VPH Institute, together with the Avicenna Alliance, has already booked its first success, as was already mentioned by Adriano at the beginning. Maybe last week, um, in the ENVI committee, there was a vote for amendments to the regulation of the European Medicines Agency, and uh, a number of Avicenna Alliance suggested amendments were included, um, specifically addressing or urging or requesting the European Medicines Agency to come up with a framework for regulatory acceptance of uh, modeling and simulation in the, the, the track to uh, regulatory acceptance. More information on this can be found on the website of the Avicenna Alliance and the VPH Institute. Next slide, please. What we can already say from this experience, uh, from the collaboration between the VPH Institute and the Avicenna Alliance, is that, well, it took a lot of work to get this uh, to broker this agreement between European Parliament political groups. And so we had Avicenna, the Avicenna Alliance work together with the VPH Institute, but also other stakeholders such as the, cent the Center for Alternatives to Animal Testing in this case. Um, and what we learned from our interactions with the Parliament was that it was very much appreciated, this concept of having this uh, equal representation of industry and research, um, talking with the same voice and, and uh, requesting the same things uh, to the parliament. So it seems to be that this concept um, will allow us to do a bit more than each of us separately maybe could have done. That's it for my part. 
Thank you. Thanks, Lise. Uh, that was pretty comprehensive. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, we're now going to move over to James Kennedy from Road of Public mm -hmm. Policy, uh, who's going to talk about uh, the general format of the working groups that are the foundation of the Alliance. James, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Adriano, and uh, thanks to everybody who's joining today. As Adriana said, I'm going to give an outline. We've, we've heard a good bit now about what, uh, what we've done in the past and what the kind of format is of the Alliance at the moment or what we're aiming to do. And I'm going to explain a good bit about uh, the specifics of how we're going to put that into action and specifically the format of these working groups and, and how, we, how you can all get involved. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so just as a, as a general format for the working groups of how the Alliance is going to, to operate, uh, we're going to have one call per quarter, so four calls a year. We're going to have a, for each working group, I should say, for each of the three working groups. We're going to have a launch call in February, which will set out the activities um, of, of uh, how to implement the activities um, of the work program that's going to be set by the board. Uh, so at board level, we're going to outline what the plan for the year is, what the priorities for the alliance will be, and then during through the working groups, we're going to implement them. We have two update calls throughout the year to uh, get updates on progress, make sure are there are any new developments that we need to take into account, we need to adjust our strategy and make sure that we're all aligned on, on the implementation of that strategy. And finally, we're going to have one call at the end of the year to review all of the activities which we've done, to take stock of what our new position is, and to feed into what the board, uh, to the board AGM, and uh, to inform the strategy for the following year as well. We can always arrange ad hoc calls if necessary, but in principle we should take, just for the sake of time-wise, and not to take up too much of that time of people who are participating, um, we should stick to the, to the four calls a year principle. Each working group is going to have its own emailing list, so the policy, policy development working group will have its own, uh, the researcher and the EU, US and Asia Pacific group. Uh, so Road to Public Policy, so, so our consultancy, which is helping the Secretariat in this, we've got quite a lot of experience in running these type of working groups, and one of the things which we've found to be the most important is to be able to set the date of all the calls for the year at the very beginning of the year. I think we all are very familiar with the concept of calendars filling up very quickly. Uh, so in, in January or we, of each year, we'll be setting what the dates of all the, all the calls uh, will be for the rest of the year. Now, 2016 is the exception for this because this is the first year of our activities. Um, and at the moment, we're kind of suffering from what I, I think we can normally refer to as, as a good golfer's complaint is that we've got so much interest. Right? Rather than trying to, to struggle to get the average channel lines off the ground or to try and get activities moving, we've got so many activities, so much interest, both internally from our very enthusiastic industry and researcher members, but also externally from the European Commission and the, the uh, US Food and Drug Administration, that we're kind of struggling to keep up in terms of getting this type of thing established. So for now, what we're really looking for is interested people who are willing to get down to work and make sure that we start implementing uh, what is a very ambitious work program for 2016. And then 2017, we're going to kick off with the kind of structure which I just outlined there, which is a little bit more systematic and a little bit more predictable. Uh, next slide, please, Adriana. Okay, so getting straight down to the first one, it's a policy development working group. Um, this is kind of the bread and butter of any kind of trade association engaged in policy, and it's going to be our, our frontline working group, our, our, the, the face of Average Channel Alliance when it comes to, uh, to policy and engagement with the EU institutions. Um, when in doubt, tasks are probably going to go to the policy development working group when it doesn't fall within the remit of the other two, which are relatively specific. Uh, so this is going to involve the kind of standard thing which we've done um, through the policy affairs working group of VPH in the past, such as drafting suggested amendments to policy dossiers, regulations and directives and bringing them to policy policymakers, uh, responded to col consultations by the Commission and the European Medicines Agency. Now there are exceptions to this uh, on the consultation side. Um, it won't always be the policy development working group, it could very well be uh, one or one or two, uh, one of the other two working groups and we've actually got quite a number on the table at the moment. For example, uh, there's one consultation by the European Commission open right now on the next stages of partnership between the US and the EU on e-health and IT. So that's kind of one which will uh, naturally lend itself to the EU, US and Asia Pacific working group. We've also got a, an expression of interest from the European Commission on uh, what are the ideas for uh, the next, for the successor to Horizon 2020? What do we want to see in FP9? Very early to be considering that kind of thing, you might think, uh, but I'll get into that a little bit more on the research working group. Uh, we'll also be looking at, this working group will also be responsible for the development of promotional material, facts and figures and key messages, and also kind of lends itself to the notion of taking the lead on, on social media and content and the update of, of, uh, update of the website. Um, naturally, in silico for, um, and I, I 
I don't exclude myself on this, it's quite a complicated topic uh, to get a grip on and for a lot of policymakers it's, it's extremely important to be able to come with very uh, concise and descriptive um, facts and figures and key messages, so that's a, quite a big responsibility for the policy development working group. How do we translate what are complex uh, messages and complex science into things which are understandable in, this, in the sense of societal challenges and how we address them? Um, now, Adriana touched on this a little bit earlier, which is that one of the main activities for 2016 will be to feed into this European Commission consultation on in silico medicine. Um, to give a little bit of a, a context on the consultation, European Commission consultations are not always, but more often than not, are the prelude to policy and new legislation by the European Commission. In terms of getting started on policy, this is as early as it gets in terms of getting involved from the ground up. The way I'd like to describe getting involved in this EC consultation on silico medicine, which, by the way, is not yet announced by the European Commission, um, the way I like to describe this is it's not just that we want to, to set the stage, we actually want to build the stage from the ground up. We want to actually make sure that the Average Channel Alliance has input into the kind of questions which is going to be, are going to be asked about in silico medicine. What direction is this conversation going to, be going to take? And we want to make sure that we're at the heart of that conversation and directing that process. Uh, next slide, Adrian, please. So to give a little bit kind of, of an example of, of how we see this process going, we want to create a little bit of a back and forth between the European Commission and the European Parliament. So to give an example of how we're going to kickstart this process, we will have, for example, our um, allies and our ally member of the European Parliament uh, pose something like a parliamentary question that will recap on the end of the two-year roadmap and of the average head of roadmap. For example, parliamentary question to the European Commission asking, in light of the conclusion of this roadmap and the significant potential which Insilico has to offer, does the European Commission feel that a consultation on Insilico medicine is needed? We, of course, will have already cleared this with our partners in the European Commission who will already know this is coming and have an answer prepared, something along the lines of, yes, indeed, we will be launching a consultation in October of this year, and blah, blah, blah. Um, we're going to wait for this consultation to be published. We will feed into this, and we will do the same with the European Commission communication, which should probably be in 2017. European Commission communication is more like a statement of intent of policy. It kind of gives an outline of what way they're going to go on policy, and what they're going to do. And this goes all the way down from general policy on uh, what way they're going to regulate things to what's going to be the funding priorities and things like this. Um, so if you see what we have just on this kind of graph, it's almost like a, a bit of a tennis match between the European Parliament and the European Commission, with Abhichen in the middle, kind of refereeing, calling at the plays and things like that. Uh, so this consultation is really the beginning of policy, and we want to make sure that uh, we get involved from the very beginning, because in this field, the earlier you're involved, the more influence you will have uh, at every stage, and the, more, the bigger the chance that your opinion is, is put forward and is prioritized in the process. Uh, next slide, please, Adriana. Um, getting to the EU, US, and Asia Pacific working group, this one is, is slightly less obvious, and I think Adriano um, outlined quite well the rationale behind the group that, and this came primarily from an industry uh, interest, but um, I, I see a, a lot of crossover in, with the research field as well. The rationale being that if we're going to start creating policy on insilico medicine, let's make sure that we're all aligned from the very beginning. Um, we've been involved here in pretty much every piece of major legislation um, with VPH from 2000 and 2012. And that includes some of the most significant um, pieces of legislation in, in the last decade, such as the Medical Devices Regulation, cross border Healthcare Directive, and things like this. What we have when we have two different regulatory systems across the Atlantic doing their own regulation in isolation is we end up with a scenario where, like with medical devices, 10 years later, if, for example, Johnson Johnson wants to change a label on one of their product units, that's 5 million right there. And we want to avoid these kind of unnecessary costs. They're pointless, and it also creates a lot of confusion. So the rationale for this group would be to collect our partners uh, together, and so our counterparts in the US and Asia Pacific region, together around the table to exchange information, to talk about uh, what we're doing, to hear about what they're doing, to make sure we can get as much alignment as possible, uh, and make sure that in, also in, in, in our own lobbying and our advocacy, that the views of our other allies um, in different regulatory systems are put forward as well. Some of this is um, best illustrated by an example, and I'll give a very recent example. Uh, which is our, our, our engagement with the FDA very recently, our exchange of information, hearing from them about the FDA rollout of a large-scale, uh, FDA-wide, in fact, modeling and simulation strategy in 2016, hearing from them about the latest activity in Congress um, in their Appropriations Committee, which now called on the FDA to work with industry to see where modeling and simulation in silico medicine uh, could be applied. 
excuse me, how best it could be how best it could be used in product development, and then also to share with them uh, what Leafit described earlier, which is a, a very significant development um, that we've been pushing for, is in the European Medicines Agency regulation. So this is the regulation which dictates how medicinal products are put on the market in the 28 member states. Um, to include there that the EMA should develop a regulatory framework for in silico medicine. And the rationale behind that is it doesn't matter how predictive your model is, it doesn't matter how fantastic uh, your simulation is, if, you can, if, if an industry cannot use this as part of their marketing authorization procedure, if they can't submit that data and have that reviewed, that's useless from a commercial point of view. Uh, and we very heavily push this um, and it's going to be, you, you'll see probably if, you, if you're paying attention to kind of the different actors in Brussels that operate in health, it's going to take quite a while for the pharmaceutical industry and other industries to realize just what happened. But when they do, they realize this was a significant development and one that will majorly affect their industry. And we were able to communicate this to the FDA. So this type of sharing of information and creating of alliances is very, very important. In fact, this group has moved ahead uh, so fast that we've actually revised one of our goals in 2016, which was supposed to be just originally about setting up a kind of a, I guess, a, a prelude to a more formal group of just having different groups talking to each other across borders and now we've instead revised it to look towards having uh, the FDA and DG Connect as observer members in the alliance. Now naturally neither of these regulatory authorities can be full actual members but observer members means that they can participate in this working group and that's what we want to have. We want to have the case where internally we can discuss uh, with our stakeholder allies what our position is and then in these more formalized groups bring to our different regulators We've worked together, this is the kind of concept which would come up, but this is what we think could work across all our borders and this is what we think should be done. Um, and last but not least for, the, for this group, uh, they've got the very important responsibility of uh, the Average China Alliance launch event in 2016, which will be held on either the 11th or the 12th of October in the European Parliament in Brussels. Um, the purpose of this event would be to address regulatory and research barriers to the uptake of silicon medicine. What are the issues being faced by the medtech, the pharmaceutical and the software industries? Um, how can we get around these? What are, what are at, a, at a more at an earlier level? What are the, the challenges being faced by researchers, and how can these be addressed? This is going to be pretty, probably an all-day slash half-day event. And we're looking increasingly, it's going to be moving towards the all-day event, at a seven, seventy-person uh, capacity room. Um, if anyone is interested in attending, do drop us a line. There's no re there's no formal registration open or anything like that. It's still early days yet, but uh, do let us know if you've been interested in attending. There's no a restriction on people who are interested, and we're very happy to have um, an open dialogue during our Q&A sessions during that event. Uh, next slide, please, Adriana. Now, I think judging by the audience of what we have, which is primarily uh, researchers from the VPH Institute and members, I think this working group is going to be a little bit closer to home and more along the lines of what the VPH in Policy Affairs Working Group has done in the past, which is why I described it as continuing activities of the VPH Policy Affairs Working Group, but expanded to include uh, quite a few new activities and activities which are now only possible as a result of having industry membership. So at least that I outlined earlier in um, her presentation, the type of work which we've done on Horizon 2020, I, I think it's important to put, put in, in perspective just how far the Policy Affairs Working Group has come on that because originally when we started work on Horizon 2020 in silicon medicine was mentioned in just one call in relation to vaccines buried deep in the text of a One Horizon 2020 call. Since we started the campaign, since we engaged uh, the European Parliament and got political support for this topic, and then went to the European Commission to show just how much political movement there is behind this, there's now a series of different calls that are relevant for VPH members and for those engaged in silico research, two of them explicitly talking about in, uh, in the title, in silico clinical trials, in silico medicine, and as Lisa described, uh, bear resemblance to the type of text which we actually put forward. Uh, in fact, the text which we put forward originally was just for one call. If you look at the carefully at what they've actually done with, with that text, is they've broken it down into, into several different sections. So they've taken our one suggestion for a call and then broken it into four different ones. So it's quite, uh, quite happy with the progress that's been made there. We want to continue that trend, make sure that we develop a suggestion for call text for Horizon 2020, bring these to the European Commission and say, this is what we think is the next stage in research and what we now need to fund. Um, the provision of scientific and technical advice uh, where necessary can't be understated. Um, Lisa talked about joining without policy and uh, um, lobbying experience. That's what we need here uh, very often is the scientific and technical side. My role um, as a consultant of the road of public policy is to act as translator between the scientific community and the um, policymakers and back as well. 
to be able to take the messages and say, right, here's what we think now, here's where it's relevant for in policy, and then for policymakers to translate back the relevance of certain policies to the scientific community and to, and to our members. But having that input from the scientific community is vitally important. Um, I think it's very often the case, and I think it's unique to the scientific community, that there's a kind of a notion that once we come to agreement on a certain issue, there, that policymakers are somehow telepathically going to know what our priorities are. These have to be communicated to policymakers, and so coming forward to us and saying, this is an issue I'm having, this should be addressed in policy, that's how movements get started, and that's how changes to regulation happen. Um, also, keeping in line with the kind of the scale of them, or the, the, the sheer momentum which this in, in initiative has, we had looked at the concept of creating links between industry and researchers uh, through, job, through training schemes and job placement schemes maybe year two, possibly even year three down the line, but we, we have had a lot of interest. Um, I, I expected a lot of interest from researchers, but significant interest from industry, our industry members as well. Adriana, you've just lost my slides. There we go. Um, we've had significant interest as well um, from industry in creating a scheme uh, for, for training and job place. And so to give an example of, of what would be in, the, in it for both groups here, um, imagine, for example, that one of our industry members needs six PhD students to do research um, in a particular field. The idea would be that that would be announced to the VPH membership at a ground level in universities, in research organizations. It would be said, if you're considering a PhD in this area, if you're considering a job in this area, go on to the Average Channel Alliance website. It's only available for VPH members and, and um, industry members. There's a possibility of having a job placement, having a training scheme here. The industry member gets the benefit of having access to a massive range of uh, young students and researchers uh, from all over Europe through the VPH scheme um, and also as a very good way of vetting who they want their future employees to be as well. Uh, and the VPH community gets the benefit of having exposure to industry, of having um, access to new opportunities in industry and then potentially jobs down the line. As I said, we had considered putting that off a little bit until year two, year three. It's going to be a task of the research working group and I think a very significant challenge uh, to get this up and running but we want to be able to announce in our October event that in 2017 we will be launching this type of scheme or that we will be um, in 2017 at some point we will be announcing that this scheme is now goes live. Um, that's the, the main provision for that. The next uh, slide please Adriana. And finally, in the long term, we kind of want to, to build a little bit on a lot of the progress we've made in Horizon 2020. Getting call text in Horizon 2020 provides the opportunity to apply for funding. and It's never any guarantee uh, that you're actually going to get it. We know, we know, for example, with Horizon 2020 that the, the applications for Horizon 2020 call have skyrocketed, but so too has the failure rate. And a lot of this is due to very arbitrary decision making in the European Commission. I, I've very often said that when it comes to Horizon 2020 calls, at any time there's a thousand good ideas in Brussels that should be funded. It will be the 100 that's got political support, will be the ones uh, that stand the best chance of, of getting funded. What we want to be able to do with this partnership of industry and researchers is we want to create ready made consortia to apply for calls. So if industries and researchers uh, want to do uh, research in a particular area and feel that this would be something which the European Commission could fund to get together on this. In the meantime, we do our standard kind of advocacy, which we've done in the past, on getting political support for this topic and a call text. We develop a call text and put it forward. And as we do so to the European Commission to say, look, we've got people standing by who are ready to apply for this. And that creates a very attractive uh, package for the European Commission. That could very well mean the difference between getting support um, for a project and not getting support for a project. So we want to make sure that we take this all the way through, not just making sure that we get the opportunity to apply for funding, but that we put together what is a perfect recipe for success of a, of a, of a Horizon 2020 project. I think that brings us to uh, our last slide, Adriano, which is, yes, if you'd like to find out a little bit more information, all of this has just been put up on our revised uh, Avery Channel website at averychannel-alliance.com. Um, I'll now pass it back to uh, Adriano, and uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, James. Um, thank you for that. It's very clear, very comprehensive. So um, there you have it, uh, how the VPH Institute is evolving to increase its influence in policy by establishing a very clear linkage between the knowledge, the experience, the understanding at the technical and developmental level that resides within uh, the research groups that pioneer a lot of these topics and its application by industry. 
as you can see uh, from those slides, the BPH Institute has been working for the in silico community very, very hard over the last number of years to raise the profile of this entire area and to be able to create uh, the opportunity for research funding for the various groups to apply for at the EU level. So I think it's important that you recognize that and if you're not a member of the VPH Institute that you're benefiting from those sort of outputs, you should be perhaps asking yourself the question, I need to be supporting these guys because they're working on my behalf. I think that's really important and I'm like those of you who know that there are people out there that aren't part of the BPH Institute, it's an unashamed advert here, get out there, slap them on the back and say, hey guys, it's about time you join this institute because they're doing some good things, which I hope you agree with. The other thing I'd like to point out is a lot of this focus has been around the EU, Europe, EU. It's EU focused, at the moment, but it's not EU centric in the sense that even the VPH Institute is not European. We have members in the States, we have members in New Zealand, in Singapore. We welcome membership from anywhere on the globe that has an interest uh, in driving this forward. Obviously, the academics join the VPH Institute. Industries that have a part to play in this join the Alliance, and, and information about that can be found on the respective websites. So. This is a call to arms. Uh, we've made a really, really good start. I think we've hit the ground running since January. There's a lot of exciting stuff on the horizon going forward. Um, I hope as many of you will get out there and join us as you can. Um, over to you, Martina, now to uh, moderate any questions that may have arisen during the talks. Good. So um, we have a question here from Dick Collert. Just one second, Dick. I'm going to unmute your microphone so you can actually talk. Here you are. Dirk, are you there? Ah, OK. He doesn't have the microphone. OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But we have, we have the question here. Um, Dick uh, actually said that he senses a shift from in silico clinical trial to in silico medicine. How come? Well, maybe I can pick that one up straight away. I mean, I think that the in silico clinical trials title on the Avicenna project, uh, if uh, if you remember and you go back and you look at the at the roadmap, encompass it was said clinical trials, but actually it encompassed the entire value chain that underpins everything that will ultimately end up in a in clinical, clinical trial. Clinical trial. So from, from my perspective, coming historically from the pharmaceutical industry, modeling and simulation early in discovery, if it's done and it's contributing to an understanding of target and compound uh, relationship ultimately in the human, is going to contribute to the way you shape your clinical trials. The whole of the value chain, uh, from soup to nuts as the Americans would say, is, is influenced potentially by the application of modeling and simulation. And in that sense, uh, it's appropriate to call it in silico medicine. The truth of the matter, what we're talking about is the use of modeling and simulation, mathematics, physics principles to understand the dynamics of complexity in healthcare. That's what we're talking about. Okay, good. We also have uh, a question from Marco. Marco, you can talk now if you have a microphone. Thank you, Martina. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for very, this very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm speaking with my hat of director of the Insignia Institute, one of the supporting members of the VPH Institute. So, if I understand correctly, you are proposing to establish three working groups in the three topics that are being suggested. And the research work group would kind of absorb most of the things that so far the VPH Institute Policy Affair work group has been doing. The question is, the, the PAWG in the VPH Institute would be disbanded then? Um, <laughs> that seems quite a harsh way of putting it, Michael. But I think uh, the PAWG, I think you, could, you can see it's evolved into a component, an important component that represents uh, the academic contribution to the discussions in policy making driving forward in one of the in one of the working groups. So 
maybe as a label within the VPH Institute, it will have, it will no longer exist in that sense. But those members of the PAWG formerly, who will who will still want to be engaged, will be part of the working group that tackles those components within the alliance. No, oh, sure. So sorry, I didn't want to sound crude. I think there are two scenarios. The first is that we maintain the PAWG within the VPH Institute, and then within that group, we, we agree for some of us participate into this Alvicena Alliance work group, or we simply directly move there. I mean, not here. I don't know, Lisbeth, uh, what, what you had in mind. Well, it also kind of depends on, on what the <clears throat> the members want. I, for one, was planning on keeping track of, of uh, activities in the three working groups so that there at least is a, a formal feedback when, for instance, we have board meetings within the VPH that we can also, from the side of the VPH, have the, the global overview. Whether all members then need to um, have this or whether we have need to have separate PWG meetings um, just with the VPH Institute, that will really depend on the kind of activities that, that will be ongoing. If we see that there is a need, we can call on those members from the VPH in the three working groups of the, of the joint uh, alliance um, to, to do something separately for the Institute. But it, it really will depend on the amount of work that we have and on, on, on the needs mm -hmm. of the Institute. Okay, so you'll, you'll let us know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then, uh, a second question, which is simpler. Uh, so, as in Signio, ideally, we should contribute with at least one person for each of the three work groups, or you are currently inviting from academic institution only membership in the research work group? No, I mean, I th James, you can come in on this as well. I mean, from my perspective, I, it's important that we have academic representation on each of the working groups for those academics that are interested in those particular discussions. So, um, uh, as, as I said right at the beginning, both at board level and in the working groups, uh, VPH has a has a, a partnership. It's a 50-50 uh, uh, partnership between between the two. So, personally, I, I would very much uh, uh, welcome academics to joining the other working groups as well. James, do you want to comment on that? Sure. I, I would just say that, you know, far from it being just a, just a kind of a symbolic thing on the board or, 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 or voting issue, it's, it's vitally important in, for, for what we produce, that we do have the, the academic input as well. If we're going to be producing things for the European Commission, which are designed to be all-encompassing, which are on behalf of an association of industry and researchers, we can't not have the academic perspective as well. Um, it's very important for our credibility, but it's also very important for the quality uh, of the output of the work which we which we put out there. Um, also on the other note of the, of the VPH policy for its working group, um, far from it being something which would, which would diminish the VPH group, um, I see this as a, as a major enhancement, in, first in, in terms of the scope and our ability to do things, but also in terms of uh, the credibility which we now have as well. I wouldn't see any point in industry going out and having their own group um, you know, when they have the opportunity of engaging with researchers any more than, than researchers now operating in complete isolation with that industry. I've noticed just from our recent activities, our recent advocacy activities, the ease of access to policymakers when you can when you can go to them and say, no, 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 we represent both the researchers and the industry in this field. Um, it's a huge difference because on the one hand, if you if you are representing just researchers, it's always a very good cause, but there's always a kind of a background notion that maybe it's not as market focused and things like this. And then if you're going from the, re from the industry point of view, it's almost viewed as, you, you, there's, it's, it's too market focused on, well, what about the research on the side of it? Going forward as a policy affairs working group, which combines both, and being able to say, here's what the entire community thinks, lends a significant degree of weight to our messages, which we want to put out. Thank you. Good. We also have another question from Thierry Marshall. Thierry, you can talk. Yeah, well, uh, first, uh, I'd like to congratulate you on this uh, great uh, initiative. We fully support that, and uh, I think that uh, we are essential. Uh, we are convinced that uh, it will go live and it will be a reality soon, and thanks to you, it will be sooner than, than later. But so I'm jumping ahead uh, a little bit. In order to fuel this kind of uh, in-situ uh, activity, 
we will need to have some uh, large library of patient specific data, both in terms of geometry, material property, and so on. And for that, I think that uh, maybe the Avicenna Alliance could help to make a reality of that. And I think that it will lead to some uh, need of modification of the legislation to make this kind of patient specific uh, data public. So is this something that you can help to make that a reality in the future? That's a really interesting question, Thierry. Um, and funny enough, I was having that specific discussion uh, in the UK with um, some people who are involved in one of the uh, uh, clinical governance groups uh, in the National Health Service where there's an initiative to bring a lot of these things together and integrate and drive forward in a combined way uh, a lot of data and apply some kind of new technologies. It's a bit unstructured in, in the way that I had it reported to me the other day, but I think there are opportunities now and initiatives that I've heard of within the United Kingdom. We've not touched base with them yet, but if we come together with an alliance such as this and, and approach those areas where there are clearly structured initiatives that involve populations of, say, a quarter of a million people in a particular um, uh, health uh, uh, district in, in, in a health service area, uh, that, that which have got a lot of complex diseases, for example, I think that there is an opportunity to try and do that. We've not focused on that yet, but that's something that perhaps we can pick up in the development in our discussions at board level. That would be Just fantastic. after Adrian as well, it's um, it's not a million miles away in terms of in terms of uh, policy either because there's quite a good degree of appetite politically for that type of thing at the moment. Actually, we've at OPP we've worked quite a lot on things like cancer registries in the past and biobanking. Um, there there is appetite for these type of.